the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. Let us, in heaven's name, drag out the divine drama from under the dreadful accumulation of slip-shod thinking and trashy sentiment heaped upon it and set it upon an open stage to startle the world into some sort of vigorous reaction. If the pious are the first to be shocked, so much the worse for the pious. Others will enter the kingdom of heaven before them. This is Dr. David Downing, (laughs) and I'm introducing the podcast this week (laughs) using the voice that Dr. Crystal Downing (laughs) often uses Uh... when introducing the episode. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I uh, am introducing this episode because we have one of the world's most distinguished Dorothy L. Sayers scholars with us, Dr. Crystal Downing, written several important books on the topic. And last week, or the last two weeks, we've been talking about these pithy essays that C.S. Lewis wrote that are all collected in The Weight of Glory. And they're so readable and so perceptive. It's really a good introduction to Lewis, the essayist, uh, apart from his creative writing. And the same is true of Dorothy L. Sayers. She has a little book called Creed or Chaos, which is seven essays in which she talks about lay theology and why people misunderstand the basics of the Christian message. And it has that same quality of just brief, penetrating essays that really quickly get to the point in a very witty way. So we'd like to take a couple of sessions to uh, talk about Dorothy Sayers as an essayist, as we did with C.S. Lewis, the essayist. So, Dr. Crystal Downing, (laughs) thank you for joining us. This book is called Creed or Chaos, and uh, Crystal knows a lot about the creed, and uh, it's a question mark. I'll ask the question. So, Aaron, that's up to you to supply the chaos. Okay, that sounds (laughs) good. I'm also here with uh, Aaron Hill, our producer. (laughs) And actually, Sayers didn't put together this book. It was put together later as a collection, borrowing the title from one of the essays in the book, much as The Weight of Glory as a book was named after uh, C.S. Lewis's essay. Which makes it super, super confusing when you're an undergraduate student trying to figure out when you're searching for creator chaos. Wait, is it the essay or is it the book? Right. Yeah, that's true. It's especially bad in Lewis studies because they'll keep recycling the same essays under a different uh, title. That's yeah. right. So yeah. you buy three books of Lewis and discover you've only uh, found two or three new essays that you didn't know <laughs> already. Mm. Well, what generated Sayers theological essays. And when people ask me, where do I go to learn more about Sayers theology? I say either Creed or Chaos for a compact mm. sense of how she handles Christian orthodoxy. Or her letters. Her letters are just filled with brilliant insight. Many times in response to these essays she wrote for Creed or Chaos. Oh, wow. So let me provide a context as to when she started writing theological essays. It goes back to that important transition in her life when Dorothy Sayers was asked to write a play for the Canterbury Festival. And she came up with Zeal of Thy House. We've talked in earlier podcasts how this revolutionized her life, that she had compartmentalized her Christianity. She was quite intentional of um, making her amateur fictional sleuth, Lord Peter Whimsey, not a Christian. She Mm. had no intention that he be a Christian. And then because she was a best-selling author, the Canterbury Festival organizers reached out to her and said, can you write a play to be performed in our cathedral? Mm. Much as a play by T.S. Eliot, Murder in the Cathedral, was performed, and a play by Charles Williams called Tom- Thomas Cranmer. Okay, uh, scholars assume that it was Williams who suggested Sayer's name, although th- th- that's murky. But because her play, Zeal of Thy House, had theological significance, it forced Sayers to integrate a passion of her life, which was the integrity of work, Mm -hmm. with Christian doctrine. Mm. But that wasn't 
the ultimate key to her essays. When Zeal of Thy House was performed in Canterbury the first week of, well, opened on June 7th of 1937, Mm. it was well received and plans were generated for it to open in London on the West End. Oh, wow. The prestigious area. Oh, wow. So they got Westminster theater, which is quite respected, to perform the play for a whole month this time, starting at the end of March in 1938. Well, Sayers, being the good advertiser she is, having worked (laughs) for an advertising firm for almost a decade, she realized, I need to draw attention to the fact that Zeal of Thy House is opening on the West End. Mm. So she started writing essays for newspapers. Oh, okay. And the very first one she wrote is the first essay that is published in Creed or Chaos. And it is called The The Greatest Drama Ever Staged is the Official Creed of Christendom. And she was talking about how Christian doctrine is inherently dramatic. Mm. And she started getting all these thank you notes from people when they read her essay in the Sunday Times. Interestingly, she had submitted it to another newspaper first, and they thought it was just too hot to handle. Really? It was too subversive, hence the title of my book, Subversive. (laughs) And the Sunday Times chose to publish it on April 3rd, 1938. So... It's interesting that she called it the greatest drama ever staged because in her mind, she's getting ready to do a 12-part radio drama yeah. on the gospel story. No, she hadn't been asked yet. Oh, she hadn't done that yet? Yeah, but I mean, she you can see the idea German in, in, oh, in, oh, the idea in her form. head yeah. that this would make right. a good drama. Yeah, because right. a few years later, she is going to yeah. turn it into a drama. Yeah, that's true. When she uses the word drama here, how is she thinking of that in terms of it being the greatest drama? Just simply because it seems like it's a word that we use today in modern usage and a very colloquial sort of way. What does she mean by just drama? Part of the reason she's using the word drama is she's trying to say it's dramatic. Okay. Drama right. has to do with larger than life characters, exciting plots. Okay. okay. Um, very high stakes on what's going on. Okay. Because often today it's used in sort of a um, soap opera sense. Right. Like yeah, a lot of drama. your life has a lot of drama in it. Right. You know, and I'm thinking that's not what she's trying to say here. And so just because that's become such a popular use of the word, I was just trying to clarify what she means here by drama. These right. larger she's than life characters. She's talking about the more technical gotcha. idea of okay. theater. Yeah. It also goes together. Uh, you see bumper stickers that say, uh, your karma ran over my dogma. So- <laughs> She's using that word uh, because dogma and drama go together. Um, she has a very good ear for oh, prose. Yeah, yeah, she does. Right. Yeah, But right. she says at one point, you know, the f- idea that God came to earth and mm. was embodied as a human being was struck down and killed, but then brought back from the dead. He said, you, she can, you can call it exhilarating. You can call it devastating. You can say it's revelation. You can say it's rubbish. But the one thing you can't say is that it's dull. Yeah. So yeah. I think she's using the word drama as a... Uh, antonym to dullness. Okay. It's right. very okay. dramatic. Well, and both both senses of the term. Gotcha. Uh, because even the zeal of the house, the great protagonist in that play, is had elevated himself in pride and then has a fall and is crippled. Gotcha. So that is his tragedy, but his tragedy becomes comedy in that he finally humbles himself. Yeah, yeah confesses his sin before God. Gotcha. I just wanted to clarify that framing because, you know, like Tolkien frames it in terms of you catastrophe and stuff like that. And it kind of shapes how you read the point they're trying to make. So I just, I was curious about that in terms of uh, her framing for the question here. Right. And I, I love how David picked up on that one passage from the dogma is the drama, uh, or excuse me, he picked up on the one passage from the greatest drama ever staged. The, that. uh, the, the stigma is the kerygma. Are you having trouble with the words there? <laughs> well, it's not, this is not the pithiest. <laughs> uh, and remember, she's writing this in the newspaper yeah. in order to draw people to a literal drama that was opening on the West End. So was there like an ad at the end of it or something in the yeah. newspaper? Or? That I don't know. Okay. I haven't All seen right. the original newspaper. Oh, that would be really so cool. what we're getting at here is that uh, Sayers became a theologian as a publicity stunt. <laughs> <laughs> well... She did kind of back into her 
position as a powerful apologist, mm. not intentionally. Well, but it's, I mean, it, it makes sense because once you start wrestling with the question of, well, why does this matter? Why should anyone care about it? Then all of right. a sudden you start asking that question yourself. Why should anyone care about theology? Why should we talk about the death of Christ? Isn't that just a boring thing that stuffy old pastors talk about on Sundays? You know? Right, right. In fact, someone reached out to her and asked her about her life journey from mm-hmm. being this best-selling detective novelist. And she talks about this incident when the show came to London and she had to do the normal press interviews and wrote the article, The Greatest Drama Ever Staged. And her point was the same point David picked up on. I wanted to prove that this is not a dull story. Oh, yeah. All I did, and here I'm quoting from her letter, all I did was tell the story in words of one syllable and insist that it was an exciting story. Yeah. And here she goes on. I love this. That did it. Apparently, the spectacle of a middle-aged female detective novelist admitting publicly that the judicial murder of God might compete in interest with the corpse in the coal hole was a sensation for which the Christian world was waiting. (laughs) Yeah, they they couldn't believe it. Yeah. And non-Christians couldn't believe it either. She kept getting all these letters. Oh, really? Is this really what Christians believe? Oh, wow. And she goes on and makes the same, makes the point that she is following the creeds. She got one letter where a person said, what you say is so different from what the church says. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then she, this is in a letter. She goes, no, no, no. My God, have I been leading these fools into apostasy? (laughs) (laughs) What I say is what the church says. Mm. Only the language is different. Throw my accursed book out the window. I have nothing to give you but the creeds. And then somebody writes her, but do you believe all these petrifying dogmas? So she was getting it from both Christians and non-Christians. Non-Christians couldn't believe that this famous detective novelist actually believed this stuff about the death and resurrection. And Christians couldn't believe that she just wasn't using the calm, normal language of every day. And uh, she actually said later about Christians and her dramatic scripts. Quote, it is curious that people who are filled with horrified indignation whenever a cat kills a sparrow can hear that story of the killing of God told Sunday after Sunday and not experience any shock at all. Oh, yeah. The whole point being they get so used to the yeah, regular familiar. language. You just go through the ritual. Yeah. You take communion and you don't think about how outrageous this idea is. Yeah. Well, they'd gone through at least a half a century of demythologizing. Right. Where they're saying, we don't know about miracles. We don't know about resurrections. But there's this moral uplift in Jesus' teachings. And we can Mm. all learn compassion. They are ironically trying to make Christianity more palatable. Lewis calls it Christianity in water. (laughs) <laughs> but they actually, yeah. in trying to make it easier to swallow, they made it not worth drinking at all. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say there, I was wondering if this is all related to, because there was a big shift in, in England before and after World War II, where before the war, people weren't super religious. and But then after the war, there was this sort of renewed interest in Christianity. And, you know, I mean, Lewis starts giving his addresses that become mere Christianity and church attendance spikes after the war and during the war and stuff like that. And I thought it might be related mm. And that's what she is responding to gotcha. since this was her play was 37 and then she wrote this first essay for the London Times. So tell us more about the article itself. What does she talk about in there, Crystal? Well, she makes this statement about how people have turned Jesus into a gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Mm, yeah. And that is not the Jesus that we get into the Gospels. Um, and she will summarize. And again, just using language that itself is shocking mm-hmm. because she's trying to get people to think in a different way. I mean, this goes back to the power of Lewis's Narnia Chronicles. Mm. He creates a lion rather than just retelling the story yeah. of Jesus Christ. And, and that creates a mental shift. 
shift yeah. rather than perpetuate what both Lewis and Sayers called a stained glass image of Jesus. Yeah. It's all prettified. Aldous Huxley called it a reverential stupor. Uh, You're sitting there and they're talking about Christ has died. Christ has, has come to life. He's risen again. You've heard it so many times. It doesn't have any kind of emotional impact. Mm. I remember the first time I saw Bible movies, even though they weren't, they weren't that good, like uh, Ben-Hur. It's not a great movie, but for some reason as a kid, it, it came to life to me like, wow, I mean, this is this oh, is the yeah. culture. Here's what the Romans are doing. Here's why they hate the Romans. Yeah. You know, here's Christ being dragged off to the cross. And I'd just never seen the story told cinematically. I'd always heard it in church yeah. language. And so even as a kid, I was kind of shocked what a vivid and graphic story it was. Somehow yeah. I'd heard it so many times in words that it wasn't really affecting me that much. Yeah. Well, but she does a really good job, not just with her language, but with like her rhetorical framing. So she mm -hmm. has that line early on, which um, we've talked about previously, where she says, before we dismiss Christ as a myth, an idealist, mm. a demagogue, a liar, or a lunatic, which sounds a lot like Lewis's yeah. <laughs> trilemma, you know, and so she uses language and, and her rhetoric that she uses, the way she frames the questions, you know, we dismiss him, um, and it sets it up in a way, it feels a lot like what Lewis does, but it's it, she's mm -hmm. very masterful with her rhetoric and the way she frames the questions. She is. Is that this essay where she ends by saying, um, perhaps Jesus is dead and buried and, and we can be done with it. Perhaps. But the last time somebody could say that with utter assurance was before the resurrection. Yeah. That was a very clever ending yeah. to the essay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And even using the phrase, which she does here and elsewhere, the killing of God, the murder of God. Yeah. People weren't used to hearing that phrase, but it, it was the murder of God if you believe the creeds yeah. that Jesus was God incarnate. Barnett, but oh no, can't let the cat kill the sparrow. You can't talk <laughs> about the murder of God, but it is the murder of God. Yeah. I love I love how she talks about what Jesus went through and he says he himself has gone through the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and the lack of money and pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. And just he does she does a really right. good job of framing it as opposed to just you know, the language that we're used to hearing it in the church that he, he was born and he lived a sinless life and then mm -hmm. he died and she humanizes him in a way that makes it, you realize, yes. oh, he lived a life just like I did. But then we turned around and we killed him for it. Yeah. And, <laughs> right. and that was her greatest passion to show that people who lived at the time of Jesus were people just like us. Yes. And some believed the stories and other just poo-pooed it. But there is a tendency among Christians to commit the docetic heresy, mm. which is not wanting to admit that Jesus was fully, fully human. I yeah. mean, they'll say it. Oh, yes, of course. Jesus was fully God and fully human. They know that that's the creed, but they don't think about what that implies. Yeah. And, and Sayers is almost like um, slapping us in the face <laughs> to take it seriously. Don't yeah. just say those words. Yeah. You got to think about it. What are the implications of it? I love how she uses uh, language when she's talking about his death and she starts talking about it in terms of we and us. What did right. we do with yeah, them? Yeah, that was good. We yeah. bribed one of his friends. We tried to, yes. we came up with the charges. Um, we wanted to get rid of him. And it's a very subtle rhetorical thing she does where her language shifts from right. talking in the abstract yes. about people back then to we and us. And she sort of puts us in the situation of like, if you were back then, you would have you would have tried to kill him as well. And uh, yeah. it's a very powerful way of framing it. Yeah. And that goes back to your comment, David, about this was a kind of preparation for her radio plays about Jesus because she explicitly wanted to make the people in those plays seem like regular Us. human right. beings. And also, she touches on the problem of evil that we don't exactly know what God is doing always, but he plays by his own rules. He came to earth. He suffered ordinary human yeah. uh, problems and, and irritations, but then he went all the way to the worst of human despair and degradation and death. Yeah. So it, she's comforted by the fact that whatever God is up to, he's he himself loved his creation, became a part of his yes. creation and yeah. suffered for it. So she, in a clever way, she also touches on the problem of evil. Right. And that goes back to the fact that Jesus wasn't just this heartwarming, touching person that just <laughs> makes us feel so cozy. Yeah. As Sayers puts it, and again, she's using contemporary popular language to shock us into thinking about what got Jesus killed 
in other words, what got God murdered, Jesus drove a coach and horses through a number of sacrosanct and hoary regulations. He cured diseases by any means that came handy, with a shocking casualness in the matter of other people's pigs and property. You know, (laughs) rather than just quoting a Bible verse, he showed no proper deference for wealth or social position. When confronted with neat dialectical traps, he displayed a paradoxical humor that affronted serious-minded people, and he retorted by asking disagreeably searching questions that could not be answered by rule of thumb. And the trouble is, rule of thumb Christians got somewhat upset about the approach she was taking because she's using all this shocking language. Yeah. Well, and also, again, she's implying that they are so they would somehow be on the wrong side of history back then. And and nobody wants to be. Yes, that's right. Right. Um, I love she goes on and I just had to read this. She says officialdom felt that the established order of things would be more secure without him. So they did away with God in the name of peace and quietness. Oh, mm-hmm. I was like, oh yeah. man, that's that's some good stuff. That'll right. reach right. suburbia. <laughs> right, right. It reminds me of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, where Christ mm. comes back in the Middle Ages and right. this high figure in the church says, no, we actually don't need you. We figured out a better system. Yeah. Right. People want mystery and authority, but they don't want that kind of disturbing elements that you brought with you. So he's yeah. actually asking Christ to, Please leave. The church has figured out a better way to be Christian than, right. yes. than the gospel. There's a really, there's a really good skit uh, by these guys. Uh, not all their stuff is Christian, so don't necessarily go out and Google it. But the Key and Peel, and they had these people praying in this group, and they're praying to God, and they want him to answer their prayers. And then God starts speaking, and they're just like utterly terrified, and they're like, "No, <laughs> stop talking to us!" And right. they're just kind of, you know, making fun of the fact that we sometimes we say that we want to hear from Him or we want to do His will, and then when He tells us, we're like, "Uh, <laughs> yeah." yeah. No. I, I didn't really Can mean I, it. That, okay. was, that was disruptive. <laughs> well, uh, we started getting into the problem of evil, and that provides a good segue for the next essay mm. that Sayers published in order to draw attention to the uh, London showing of oh, Zeal of Thy House. So it's part of the same publicity? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So two weeks later, she published in the Sunday Times an essay called The Triumph of Easter. And she begins with that famous phrase from Augustine, Felix Culpa. So we should talk about that because she then uses that as uh, a way to get into this issue of the problem of evil. And David, why don't you comment on Felix Culpa? It doesn't have to do with a cat. Felix culpa means, oh, happy fall or oh, happy sin. Felix is the same word as felicity. I'm full of felicity. And culpa is the same root as, oh, that person was culpable. Uh, They were to blame for uh, the crime. So Felix couple means, oh, fortunate fall, oh, happy sin. Yeah. Uh, Augustine was saying, in some strange way, Christ was able to take Adam and Eve's fall and redeem it that in a way that made creation even more glorious. Yeah. John Milton said, well, Adam and Eve were doing very well, but they were living in a kind of vegetative bliss. And he thinks exercising their free will. This is a very, um, uh, well, Aaron, you know better than we do in terms of theology, but it's a very uh, edgy sort of approach to the yeah. problem of evil. Yeah, there's there's kind of two, two takes on it. One of them is that... Uh, it takes a kind of a deterministic approach, like it was right. part of the plan from the beginning. Right. Some people don't really like that very much because of all the evil that happened, and it tends to call what's evil good. And then there's the other approach, which Sayers kind of takes here, which is that you know God can God is so awesome that He can make good out of any even our worst deeds, and so we can call it fortunate looking back, but it's not necessarily like He wanted. Hitler to show up on the scene and have a Holocaust, you know? Right. I first encountered that phrase in Paralandra. Uh, the the evil character, Weston, is trying to get this unfallen Eve character to disobey Maleldil yeah. by staying on the floating island overnight. And Ransom really has to think about it because he says, well, there is a doctrine of Felix Culpa. So that's where I first ran into that phrase. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but the the character decides, yes, God can redeem human mistakes, but he doesn't set out and expect a human mistake in order for him to bring something better. Right, yeah. right. Well, and, and she talks about that in the essay. She essentially says, like, it, it, you know, I'm not saying that we should go out and do bad things. Right. But God can make good of them, right. which is, you know, echoing what Paul says when he, he talks about the same yes. concept. Yeah, yeah, shall we sin that grace may right, yeah. right. abound? And she's basically arguing that evil exists 
because God is good. Okay, you go, wait, Wait, how can evil exist? And because the classic problem of evil is how can an all powerful, all good God allow evil to happen? Yeah. And so she starts the whole essay with a paradox. Mm -hmm. Felix Culpa, fortunate fall. How can the, uh, the fall be fortunate? Yeah. But then she goes on to say God's goodness is manifest in the fact that God did give humans free will. Mm. And she uses here the image of a puppet. That it's like people, and especially, you know, the more deterministic type Mm -hmm. interpretation, they just want to see that, think of humans as marionettes on strings that God is manipulating. But that defeats the whole idea of love. Because true love doesn't just say, oh, I'm going to create something that totally serves my best interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, love is um, wants the return of love to be a choice. Yeah. There's also this element of arrogance that comes with those comments where we feel like we know better than God. Like we could have, if all of it was up right. to me, I could have designed a system where people had both free will and never sinned. And you're just kind of like, Okay, all right, you keep thinking that. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, I love her. She kind of has this rhetorical thing where she says, well, why doesn't God yes. smite the dictator dead? Can we talk about that for a second? Because yeah. I thought it was a very good right. argument that she makes there. Her first response is like, why, madam, did he not strike you dumb and imbecile before you uttered that baseless and unkind slander the day before yesterday? <laughs> And her point is that your misdeeds and mine are nonetheless repellent because our opportunities for doing damage are less spectacular than those of some other people. And her point is, if you say that, what you're doing is you're drawing a line and saying, well, these sins are the ones that I want God to prevent. But the sins that I commit are not significant enough that God should stop what I'm doing. And she's basically saying, you're being a hypocrite by doing that. Uh, And you're essentially going around saying, well, I think your sins are bad and your sins are bad and mine are okay. And that would be a horrible place to live. And so that's obviously why God doesn't do that, because it would be taking away some people's free will, but not others. Right. Although I I wouldn't mind mind trying it out for a while and see how it works. (laughs) (laughs) Have other people's sins erased, but mine are are somehow forgiven and woven into the fabric of reality. Uh, Lewis has a a similar passage in Problem of Pain. Why doesn't he stop that bullet from assassinating that noble figure, turn it into a puff of air? Well, he would need to go back a step and say, what about the words that inflame people to shoot someone? How do you get rid of those words? Well, if you're going to have those words, uh, maybe we need to erase the thought, which led to all these hateful words. And after a while, free will is gone. Once God starts intervening, you would do things out of the fear of retribution. You wouldn't do things because you honestly wanted. I also like how she frames it rhetorically here because she says, do you suggest that your doings and mine are too trivial for God to bother about? And she's saying that not just in the sense of evil, but in good because she says that cuts both ways for in that case it would make precious precious little difference to his creation if he wiped us both out tomorrow meaning if you think he doesn't care about the bad things you do then you're also assuming he doesn't care about the good things you do it would be totally okay if he got rid of you and so she's saying like we have to treat people as if they're significant and they can do Mm -hmm. both good and evil and if you wipe out one, then you wipe out the possibility mm-hmm. of the other. Uh, right. And so it's a, it's a very interesting way to frame it, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Well, and it explains a lot of those things that shock us when a, a politician, let's say, gets him or herself involved in some kind of torrid affair and um, they lose their position and respectability. And you go, how could they possibly be so dumb as not to realize that they are in a public position <laughs> and things are going to come out? But it's probably because they get away with a tiny little sin yeah. and they're used to their power and they have a uh, greater expansiveness for their power and they just slowly tread the path to hell. Doesn't Lewis have a line like that, that hell is approached one step at a time? Yeah, in the screw tape letters, he talks about it's a very gentle slope. There's no right. signs, there's no markers, there's no cliff that you fall over. It tends right. to be yeah. a, uh, just step by step. I do wonder, sometimes those figures, uh, they get so used to preaching and having a public figure that they develop this kind of schizophrenia where there's public figure knows exactly what to say and how to handle it. I think if you're honest early on and your public figure and your private figure are closer together, yeah. you're less subject to saying, well, 
in my private life is my own. That's only my public persona. Right. So what is her point here then about the triumph of evil? She kind of talks about the problem of evil or not the triumph of evil, the triumph of Easter. Um, she talks here about the <laughs> yes, problem thank of you. evil. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so because she at some at a certain point, she makes makes a turn and she says, OK, so when Judas sinned, Jesus paid. He brought good out of evil. And she sort of uses the contrast between Judas and Peter, which I think is interesting because that's a key part of her uh, play that she goes on to do. That was right? a, a great comment. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, Crystal talked about the Judas character in her radio plays, but I loved her idea that Judas's greatest sin was not betraying Jesus. It was killing himself. He yeah. should have waited to see how the sin could be redeemed. Yeah. Peter felt awful for betraying Jesus. At least he stuck around long enough to see how things would play out, which would be the most glorious reversal uh, yeah. in history. She says, uh, Judas committed the final, the fatal, the most pitiful error of all, for he despaired of God and himself and never waited to see the resurrection. Yes. Yeah, I've never yeah. thought of that, his, his sin. Uh, Crystal, at some point, are you going to read that passage on how oh, disappointing yes. the disciples were? Yes, and this goes back to Aaron's original comment of why I call it a drama, because she is showing how dramatic things are. Mm. And she's talking about the disciples. And once again, she wants to get us away from a stained glass view of the disciples. And everybody was just so good and supportive. And yeah, Judas was a bad man. And she totally subverts that in Man Born to be King by making Judas the smartest disciple (laughs) who um, recognized Jesus's messianic calling. Yeah. But she goes on to say about the disciples in this triumph of Easter, as for their own parts in the drama, nothing could now alter the fact that they had been stupid, cowardly, faithless, and in many ways singularly unhelpful. Even that understatement is pretty funny. (laughs) But they did not allow any morbid and egotistical remorse to inhibit their joyful activities in the future. They had seen the strong hands of God twist the crown of thorns into a crown of glory. And in hands as strong as that, they knew themselves safe. They had expected an earthly Messiah and they beheld the soul of eternity. They had seen the face of the living God turned upon them, and it was the face of a suffering and rejoicing man. So she starts the whole essay with the paradox of Felix Culpa and ends with the paradox of suffering and rejoicing yeah. in Christ. Yeah. Mm. I thought it was a really powerful essay. I especially uh, liked her discussion of uh, framing of the question of evil. Typically, when we talk about that, we just talk about how Lewis frames it. So I thought it was really good to see Lewis, uh, right. Sayers framing there. So there's a third essay we wanted to talk about. Right. Also, April of 1938. Oh, wow. Drawing people's attention to this West End production of Zeal of Thy oh, House. When was Easter that year? I wonder if these are all uh, Linton preparations. Oh. Because oh. this is April. Yeah, yeah. So, she does talk about how, as they are rehearsing for the play, that it's stressful because of all the Lenten activities. Hmm. Oh, okay. So, but I didn't this, like this that. This actually would be a good Lenten reading, this whole book. We talked about Weight of Glory, mm. but it would be good to work through these essays in oh, yeah. Lenten season because there's so much about the gospel message. Um, once again, back to this idea, and she's reminding us of a new drama in town, but she's Uh, calling it The Dogma is the Drama, and I keep getting the two titles confused. Oh. The strongest or the greatest drama ever staged, and now The Dogma is the Drama because she's using that same tactic. Gotcha. So, David, what did you think of this essay? Well, I liked the catechism. She's really trying to get people to deal with Orthodox Christianity as it is in all of its shocking revelations. And she doesn't like how everything's become confused and watered down in the popular mind. Right. And so I think my favorite part was that catechism where she talks about how people understand the basic nature of God and his work in the world. Yeah. And to, um, I think we should read part of that catechism, but what's interesting is how she sets it up, as you say, that Christianity has become so watered down in her era, and she says how people in the 20th century are saying, away with the tedious complexities of dogma, let us have the simple spirit of worship, just worship, no matter what. Yeah. And... <laughs> 
It reminds me of that famous book published in 2005 by Christian Smith called uh, Soul Searching the Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. And he was this sociologist Mm. who interviewed all these teens in the early 20th century. And he came up with this phrase that he called moralistic therapeutic deism. Oh, yeah. That's what teenagers are into. You know, it's not about dogma. It's just about being moral and feeling spiritual. And all of that was therapeutic, moralistic therapeutic deism. And I remember when I was teaching at a secular university um, back in the 1990s, and my fellow colleagues would hear that I was a Christian or my students would ask me, you know, are you a Christian? Some of the things you say, Mm. because I'm not, I wasn't very explicit. And often they would say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Oh yeah. And it just kind of means I'm moralistic Mm. and I try to be kind to people. And that's good therapy for me. Yeah. And Lewis, and excuse me, (laughs) Sayers says, no, we got to get back to the actual drama of the dogma, of the creeds. And the trouble is, even that word dogma has been destabilized by the word dogmatism. Oh, you're so dogmatic if you insist on certain dogma. But the thing is, atheists are as dogmatic about their atheistic dogma as well. Yeah, everybody's dogmatic about something. It's just a question of what, yeah. Right, and it's too bad that that word has been corrupted. So um, I think doctrine is perhaps a better word. There's a line in Lee Finger's uh, Peace Like a River, where his father's this kind of fundamentalist preacher, but with these interesting supernatural powers. Oh, right. And uh, the son says to the father, well, Mr. Somebody said, you're just a Bible thumper. And the father says, well, well, everybody thumps something. <laughs> that was a pretty good way to that put is, it, I thought. That yeah. is a good way. I like how she she diagnoses it here, though, because I think this applies today. She says there's a drawback to this demand for, as she calls it, generalized and undirected worship. Uh, and she says it's the practical difficulty of arousing any sort of enthusiasm for the worship of nothing in particular. Yes. Right. And right. it's sort of this sense in which if you get rid of a, a concrete set of beliefs that you that are all agreed upon that that is sort of the you know nucleus of our worship then what are you worshiping what are you you know you're just sort of singing about stuff you know you're just there talking or or the sermon becomes just sort of therapy for the people in the congregation you know and you're not actually feel goodism yeah yeah uh and so what's interesting about her approach is she criticizes that at the one extreme but then also the people who repudiate christianity at the other extreme and she says in this essay um it is startling to discover how many people there are who heartily dislike and despise Christianity without having the faintest notion what it is. <laughs> They've gotten this misrepresentation right. of it. And I know I've gotten that response to my book, Subversive, which I'm trying to explain how Sayers shocks people into recognizing the ancient truth of Christianity, but just by using new language. Mm. And people have written to me and said, I didn't realize this is what Christians believe. Really? And they've, yeah, they've just gotten, and again, part of it is we become inured to the fact of hearing the same phrases over and over. Uh, And so she then goes from there into this actual dramatic litany of what she thinks a lot of people in her own day um, consider Christians believe. And I think it's as relevant today yeah. as it was back in 1938 when she wrote this. So David, it's, do you want to It's a little like of, screw tape letters. She's giving is. you kind of an upside down view yeah. of how people understand theology. Yeah, that's a great point because we want to make clear, and some people read screw tape letters and thought that the advice was we were supposed to take it seriously and they were upset. No, mm-hmm. you, um, that's not the way. Yeah, that's you, diabolical. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, that's, that's the, the point. point. <laughs> in my uh, in my edition, which is like a uh, optical character recognition version of it, uh, it's like an electronic version, they read uh, the title of her play wrong and it's The Zeal of Thy Mouse. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> I was reading through it and I thought, that sounds like a good title for a play about Reap It Cheap. <laughs> but anyways... <laughs> 
that's, 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 that's good. That is good. <laughs> so what is she? Uh, what are the sort of things that she frames here? The sort of up, upside down. So this is a sarcastic parody of uh, the the creeds or the catechism, as many people understand them. Right, uh, and, and like, I, it could have been written by um, screw tape. Right. Okay. Uh, Chris and I read this once at an alumni event, and people in the audience were scratching their heads going, well, that's not good theology. <laughs> I thought she was supposed to be. So we have to stress again, this is a parody of many people's misconceptions gotcha. about theological uh, doctrines. So you guys are going to give us your uh, dramatic reading of this. Right. Yes. David will ask the questions, and I will be the voice okay. of Sayers, okay. providing her satire of what people in her own day thought. Gotcha. Okay. And if right. you misunderstand it and you need to write an email, write it directly to Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to set up the question, and Crystal's giving many people's concepts of how to answer that question. All right. What does the church think of God the Father? He is omnipotent and holy. He created the world and imposed on man conditions impossible of fulfillment. <laughs> he is very angry if these are not carried out. He sometimes interferes by means of arbitrary judgments and miracles distributed with a good deal of favoritism. <laughs> he likes to be truckled to and is always ready to pounce on anybody who trips up over a difficulty in the law or is having a bit of fun. <laughs> He's rather like a dictator, only larger and more arbitrary. Okay, that was helpful. <laughs> what does the church think of God the Son? in some way to be identified with Jesus of Nazareth. It wasn't his fault that the world was made like this. And unlike God the Father, he is friendly to man and did his best to reconcile man to God. He has a good deal of influence with God. And if you want anything done, it's best to apply to him. <laughs> ah, and what does the church think about God the Holy Spirit? I don't know exactly. He was never seen or heard of till Pentecost. There is a sin against him which damns you forever, but nobody knows what it is. <laughs> what is the doctrine of the Trinity? The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the whole thing incomprehensible. <laughs> it's something put in by theologians to make it more difficult. It's got nothing to do with daily life or ethics. <laughs> what is meant by the atonement? God wanted to damn everybody, but his vindictive sadism was sated by the crucifixion of his own son, who was quite innocent and therefore a particularly attractive <laughs> victim. He now only damns people who don't follow Christ or who never heard of him. Okay, thank you. Uh, what does the church think of sex? God made it necessary to the machinery of the world and tolerates it, provided the parties A, are married, and B, get no pleasure out of it. <laughs> what does the church call sin? Well, sex. <laughs> Otherwise than as accepted above, getting drunk, saying damn, murder and cruelty to dumb animals, <laughs> not going to church, most kinds of, uh, kinds of amusement. Original sin means that anything we enjoy doing is wrong. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt with Mark Twain here. He said, I don't know why they call it original sin. I could have thought of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to Dorothy's uh, parody a catechism here. What is faith? Resolutely and shutting your eyes to scientific fact. What is the human intellect? A barrier to faith. <laughs> what are the seven Christian virtues? Respectability, childishness, mental timidity, dullness, sentimentality, censoriousness, and depression of the spirits. Okay, so that's a sample of her catechism of all people's <laughs> misunderstandings of Christian doctrine. Yeah, it's very, uh, very witty, very that's enjoyable. Really funny. Yeah. Right, right. And once again, shocking people into, by parroting it, they kind of realize, well, that is kind of what I thought, that God was arbitrary and, you know, you just had to appeal to Jesus if you wanted yeah. anything done. And then she ends with this powerful statement that returns us to the idea of drama. Let us, in heaven's name, drag out the divine drama from under the dreadful accumulation of slip-shod thinking and trashy sentiment heaped upon it 
and set it upon an open stage to startle the world into some sort of vigorous reaction. If the pious are the first to be shocked, so much the worse for the pious. Others will enter the kingdom of heaven before them. Mm. And And then I love the very ending of this essay. Okay, you want to read that? The terrifying assertion that the same God who made the world lived in the world and passed through the grave and gate of death. Show that to the heathen, and they may not believe it, but at least they may realize that here's something a man might be glad to believe. Mm. Mm. Uh, Sometimes as a Christian, all you can do is say, well, if I can't bring you to faith, at least I hope I can show you the beauty of the faith. Yeah. Right. At least bring it a level of respectability. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and intellectual justification of the faith. Yeah. One of the things that Sayers repeated in her letters is that she didn't have that, have a conversion experience. She just became more intellectually convinced of the legitimacy of the creeds. Gotcha. And so she doesn't respond to Christianity on an emotional level. Mm. She says, what I have is a passionate intellect. And Christianity appeals to my passionate intellect. Mm. This is the greatest drama ever staged, and people don't understand it. Yeah. Tell her about her comment when people would ask her, when were you saved? Oh, this is so good. Uh, I heard this at a conference. I haven't been able to track it down in print, but it's a wonderful summation of what she would say. Mm. When someone asked her, when were you saved? She responded, when Christ rose from the dead. Mm. It's Jesus that saves us. And the trouble is, too often the rhetoric of Christianity makes it sound like it's all dependent on us. Yeah, You've got to go through this process of repentance. You've got to say the right words. Yeah. You've got to do this, this, and this. And then if you do the right things, you're saved. Yeah. No, Jesus saves us. Yeah. And all we do is accept the gift yeah. of salvation. Yeah. Well, uh, this is really cool to talk about Sayers. We don't talk about her all that often on her own. She mm. she manages to find her way into pretty much uh, every yes. other episode, but it's good to talk about it. So we're going to talk about the rest of these uh, essays in the next podcast? I think we should. There's a lot more good material in this anthology. Okay, yes. good. Well, we'll come back to Creating Chaos then. Great. Thanks. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, past collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.